take your seats. Members of the Council of the Federation, MPs, citizens of the Russian Federation, my today's address will be focused mostly on our domestic issues, such as healthcare, first and foremost, social policies, social welfare, economy, and the last but not the least, our foreign affairs, just a couple of words on that to describe how matters stand in the field of security. I will start with what happened last year, where our country and the whole world was confronted by a new threat, a threat we never encountered before, a new infection. During the many meetings with specialists and experts, leaders of the countries of the world, I've heard from them that we were confronting absolutely unknown threat. It was like that, indeed. From the regions of Russia, we received a lot of information on the fact that we had uh, an uptick in the number of beds required for people. Many of the hospitals were overflown. Some said that some of the ICU wards were lacking oxygen, ventilators, PPE. We were distributing them across the country, one by one. As for the market situation, we had very low supply of such things as sugar, uh, as products which are essential. So the pandemic was attacking us on all fronts. With a lot of alarm in the heart, and I was alarmed very much. But I was also sure that we would overcome all the challenges, all the obstacles on the way. The society, the people acted responsibly in solidarity with one another. We stood united. We were working at a pace which was higher than that of the pandemic. We were, were decreasing the risks of the spread. We were giving out the PPEs to people. We increased by five times to the level of 280,000 beds at hospitals across Russia in order to cater to the need of those who had covered. We have been working hard. Millions of people have been working 24-7 across Russia. And I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for all the work you've put into it. We've been working fast. We've been working responsibly. We were analyzing the situation all the time in order to keep our hand on the pulse. I remember when I came to the Kominarka Hospital because I wanted to see how it was, what kind of threat we were confronted with, how people were working in these conditions because our doctors, they were on the front line. They were fighting for the lives of our people. Together with us here, we have a lot of doctors, medical professionals of all levels, rank and file professionals. And I would like to thank you, to thank all of you, whenever in you are, We've made a breakthrough thanks to our scientists and today we have three effective and efficient vaccines against COVID-19. That's something we did ourselves and that is a testament to the fact that our scientific potential is growing. Now I'd like to say that I'm very grateful to all those who helped us to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Those who've been producing drugs and medicines, ventilators, equipment, PPEs, the non-disruptive companies and facilities, the utilities, businesses who've been working fast, modernizing, revamping their production facilities and capabilities to help the country. Those who helped with construction, both civilians and military, those who've been harvesting record high amounts of crops, over 130 million tons, a record high amount of crops. The law enforcement and the special services have been working hard to ensure safety and security. And our military stood guard. I'd like to thank the social sector workers, those who worked at the nursing homes, hospices across Russia. They were 
standing at the beds of the patients, helping them. I think you would agree that sometimes when you look at what is happening, you can feel uh, happy, happy for those who continue working responsibly against all evil. And I, almost with tears in my eyes, want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've been doing. And I would like to say thank you to all teachers, and professors, schools, universities, colleges, with the help of students and parents, you've done everything possible to continue giving the best quality education possible. Cultural life never stopped, thanks to new technologies. We transferred our cultural activities online. Theaters, cinemas, concert halls have been remaining open, thanks to online technologies. Thank you for being on par with the high demand and the necessity to keep the cultural life going. I know it's been hard, but still we need to follow all the guidelines. We have mounted an impenetrable defense in the face of the pandemic. We've seen practice how everyone was ready to help others. Those who needed that help, millions of people became volunteers. They were helping to route the patients and the doctors. We stand together. That movement helped people of all ages. It was one of the pillars for our society. And we know how to help when the time of need comes. And I'd like to thank all those who come from the traditional religions of Russia, thank you very much to all of you. Throughout the history of our nation, we have always been victorious. We have always overcome each and every challenge thanks to our unity, friendship, families, helping each other, solidarity and unity. That's what unites us today, our spiritual, values, our cultural values that some countries have started to forget about still keep us together and we will stand firmly in support of these traditional values which are our bonds, things which keep us together. Colleagues, we've been confronted by a pandemic at a time which overlap with other problems such as the demographic downturns caused by the events of the 1940s and 1990s. Today, the demographic situation is dire. We have to acknowledge that and we need to act fast on it. We need to preserve the population. That's the top priority for us. This priority is visible through all of the new amendments of the Constitution to protect family, to protect parents and their role in families, to for us better social guarantees to protect our culture and values. What we need to do is to achieve sustainable growth of the population so that in the year 2030, the average life expectancy in Russia would be 78 years. The statistics shows that, well, the results so far are not satisfactory. We've had a dip. We know why. It's the pandemic we should blame for it. But our strategic goal remains the same. Our priority is to increase the life expectancy. I know full well that this is no small feat. It's indeed a tall order. And yet I believe that even though compounded by the pandemic, which is still here, still around, it's still a threat to all of us. And we see that many countries of the world see rise in infections. What we need to do today is to keep control of the situation. We need to stand guard on our front lines, protecting our country from the pandemic. And we need to be wary of the pandemic inside the country. Again, I'd like to say it to you. Do not let your guard down. Please take care of, you, of your families and friends. Please act responsibly. Follow all the guidelines. It is of immense importance to carry out the vaccination successfully. I call upon the authorities at all levels to be working hard to make sure that people get an access to vaccines across Russia so that by autumn we'll have that herd immunity in place across the country. We must do that. We have to do that. Once again, please, I call upon every one of you, every Russian citizen, please go take 
that jab. This way, we will nip this epidemic in the bud. There is no other way. The only way what we still might see is to get infected, but the consequences are unknown. So get vaccinated. Of course, there is still that danger, but now it's time to think how we should be recovering and helping people to recover. At the peak, our hospitals and clinics had to stop giving the patient access to medical health care to some extent, and that is why chronic diseases reared their head, and that leads to the following fact. Sometimes it was impossible to diagnose a disease on time. So given the situation now, I think it's time to expand the annual checkups. I think we can super charge this effort and so that starting from July this year, it will be available for people of all ages. We need to do that on a wild scale basis. We need to start distributing mobile healthcare units, vehicle based units. One of the first targets for the coronavirus pandemic is your heart and your cardiovascular system. That is why we need to extend the helping hand first and foremost to those with cardiovascular diseases. And I believe that we need to implement additional measures to prevent and treat these diseases because they are one of the major causes for people to die before their time. Also, cancer is a problem. Respiratory tract, lungs are also a target. A lot of people fall victim to hepatitis C. And I believe that by adopting appropriate measures, we can reduce to minimum the threats with the outlook of 10 years. We believe that people should go to the resorts and to facilities which are there to them to recover and improve their health. Today we have a cashback program which gives people 20% of all they've spent. And I think this should remain as it is for the time being. Our special note is the health of our children. When you are young, you build up your immunity for the rest of your life. So we need to give our children opportunity to have access to resorts. And I believe that we should be giving half of the money parents spend on their children to go to holidays somewhere back to them. That is why 50% of the money spent on children camps should be given back as cash back. Students should be our priority as well. And this year we should start a pilot project so that students could live on campuses in other regions. Those who will be traveling across Russia during summer should get bonuses. We need to encourage the volunteers who participated during the Olympic Games and the many volunteer projects that we've had including Russia, the country of opportunities platform. For these people, I believe we can give them back some of the money they spend on their holidays. That would include the time when they are off their educational duties, so to speak, during the peak season of traveling. And I'd like to thank all the parties who supported the decision to set up a new tax on high incomes, on some of the high incomes the money we got, we've been allocating to a special fund, the Circle of Kind-Heartedness. We give that money to buy the medicines necessary for children with rare diseases so that they will have the equipment and the drugs, as well as we cover all the surgeries for them. I know that this year we'll be celebrating the anniversary of our emergency ambulance services. They are the people who are on the front line fighting for the lives of people. The 28th of April will be marking that day and in the next three years we'll be allocating three to five more thousand vehicles to work as ambulances across Russia in remote areas in the villages or faraway regions so that the fleet will be modernized, upgraded and revamped. Some of the leading countries of the world, and we know it full well because they said it themselves, failed to work as effectively as we done. They failed to rise to the occasion. However, 
Global healthcare today is on the brink of a revolution. We should not miss the opportunities. This pandemic has highlighted and accelerated the growth of telemedicine and healthcare. New diagnostic measures, new surgeries, new rehab programs and new drugs have been popping up across the world and we need to be working hard so that all these new technologies and things would work to the benefit of our people. On a new technological basis, we should build our new healthcare system, at the same time taking care of the day-to-day -day problems, and we know there is a lot of them. First and foremost, the front line, the first immediate care. There should be no queues. Signing up, booking a visit should not be a problem. You should be able to get a sick leave in no time. We've been talking about that a lot. We have the money in place, we have earmarked it. Now it's time to work. It's time to deliver on our promises. Our healthcare, as well as other public sector areas, there are still some problems that remain. Financial, managerial problems. What we need to do is to allow people to have high quality, timely help and care. And that is why we believe that healthcare should be part of the agenda at the State Council meeting, which is to take place soon. Once again, we have new experience of working in social spheres. During the pandemic, we supported with direct payments the families that have almost 28 million children. And these payments were done without any paperwork without any red tape, it was done automatically the way people need it. I know that the members of the government worked on it and they did a targeted work, not without some mishaps, but they did everything to make this work and they did. And that's great, that's a good example. This approach, this approach should be a standard to work at all the levels of the government. That's the main idea of national social initiative that was discussed during the previous meeting of the presidium of the social council and the national initiatives department. Your direct work, uh, your job is to make schools, clinics and uh, employment centers, to make them work so that they work for the people, for the families in a lot of regions. And I saw it with my own eyes. They already work in some areas like this, but we need to make it comprehensive along the entire social range. And the next year, in 2022, we must introduce social banking principle. It means that all the payments, all the welfare, all the social welfare, all the services should be paid in one shop stop. So without running around a lot of agencies and departments, so they should facilitate creating a family, having a child, uh, retiring or any other social situations. In three years, the vast majority of the state and municipal services must be provided to the citizens of Russia remotely. 24-7, it means that they should be able to get these services whenever they want to. And I should speak uh, about uh, one sensitive topic as uh, payments for the families that you abandon. It's a problem because it should not be humiliating. All the matters must be resolved uh, remotely as much as we can and for the s those who suffered the most single mothers with children uh, shouldn't go to agencies trying to collect all the necessary papers we should try to make the interdepartmental services including the banks to make all the decisions regarding these payments automatically. The state must defend and protect the rights of a child. That's what I'm talking about here. And I will get back to this topic a little bit later. Dear colleagues, we understand what kind of blow was dealt by the pandemic, by the epidemic to the welfare of the people. We know it well, we're well aware of that using the figures that we have uh, the social inequality, the poverty, it all 
became more obvious. It was a challenge for all the countries in the world, for all the nations. It doesn't happen only in our country. It's the same with everyone. But it goes for Russia as well, because we are, first of all, interested in the situation in Russia, because the prices are growing. Uh, the, of course, some urgent decisions were made, but relying only on targeted on the executive orders, we can't work like this. We remember what it can lead to. From, from the 1980s, from the 1990s, empty shelves at the grocery stores, that's what we saw in the late 1980s. But now, even when the epidemic spiked, we didn't allow this. And the task of the government to create a long-term solution, long-term conditions, and I would like to emphasize this, using market mechanisms, and we do have those mechanisms that will uh, make everything productible. We shouldn't be the ones who set the prices. We shouldn't work like this. We shouldn't intimidate everyone with this, frighten everyone with this. There are market mechanisms, and we need to apply them timely and in the volume, in the scope uh, that the situation demands. Uh, by decreasing risks for the business, by encouraging investments. So because it could work together, it could be done together, and we should provide the real income growth. We should restore it, and we should increase it even more. We should uh, change the situation with the poverty, as I said before, and the state should provide the direct support for the families with children who are in a dire situation. This is our policy, and we are going to follow this policy in the future, too. We already have the system of uh, payments for the first child and for the second child for up to three years, and these payments are given to the families where the income per capita is less than two subsistence wages. And in average, these figures are 11,300 rubles per month per child. In 78 constituent regions, uh, they also have payments for the third child, and on average in the country, this sum is also 11,300 rubles per month per child. And I would like to direct your attention to this. We are working on this uh, step by step. Last year, we introduced the payments for the children from three to seven years old, and the size of this payment varied. And on average, it was from uh, 5,650 rubles up to 11,300 rubles per month. And I urge the government, instruct the government by the 1st of July to prepare the comprehensive system because we should bring down to minimum the risk of becoming poor for such families. But we need to introduce new solutions right now, already today, because it's always difficult to raise a child uh, with, with a family with only one parent. And there could be a lot of reasons for this. And uh, we shouldn't discuss the reasons why it happened. We need to support these children. And it's especially difficult when such a family also have some uh, financial hardship, especially when children go to school. So the expenses for, for the family budget are also increasing. We need to support the families where a mother or a father are single parents and they raise a child on their own. And the birth certificate, I'm sorry that I'm talking about such routine things, but that's what people face on everyday basis. And where a birth certificate doesn't mention one of the parents or parents uh, are divorced and one of them has a child support payment, the right to get child support payment. So from the 1st of July, kids from 8 to 16 years old that are growing in such families will be paid will be allocated a payment and its size on average across the country will be 5,650 rubles per month. And of course, we need to support the women who are expecting a child and they also have uh, financial problems at the same time because the future mothers should feel the support from the society, from the state to keep a child. She should be confident that she will be helped to raise this child. So for those women who are at early stages of their pregnancy and who are in a dire financial situation, they should get a monthly payment uh, 
and its size will be on average 6,350 rubles per month. Next, currently the health, the sick leave payment depends on the work experience, but then young women, such payments are much lower. So this was discussed at the State Council and by the United Russia Party as well. All the laws, uh, relevant laws must be adopted in the near future so that starting this year, sick leave to take care of a child of up to seven years old must be 100% of their salaries. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. So most of you present here attending this conference understand the bigger the work experiences, the bigger the payments are. So those women who have a lot of work experience get 100%, but they usually don't uh, deliver children, don't bear children anymore. And those who do, they don't get 100%. So we need to support those who are expecting a child. And I would like to remind you that we extended up until 2026 the program of maternal capital. Now, after you get the very first child, you are entitled to get this maternal capital. We didn't have that before. And now this maternal capital is uh, for 640,000 rubles. Uh, starting from the January 1st of the last year, we are providing hot meals for all the primary school students. And this measure has become uh, great support for the families as well. And during the pandemic, all our decisions were aimed to support the citizens. I understand that now a lot of people uh, are going through hard times. The employment, the job market, and the real income of the citizens will be restored and we will move even further, but it hasn't happened yet. And in this regard, I suggest to have, to give one more payment to the children uh, where children of school age, namely 10,000 rubles per every uh, school student that a family has. And uh, even more than that, oh, the future first graders should also get the support. The kids who are only going to school this year, we will give the payment in mid-August so that the parents had time to prepare their child for school. The the renov renovated constitution has stipulated the support for the families and it should be supported at all the levels of the government. So every national project should have a special area, designated area uh, to support younger people, to support the youth. Dear friends, during the pandemic, a lot of doctors and nurses uh, who graduated basically yesterday, the medical students and paramedics, they entered the so-called red zones and they worked shoulder to shoulder with their more experienced colleagues. Uh, the teachers, the students, the college students, university students kept uh, learning. They were passing exams and taking exams. These kids supported their parents, older family members, and the younger people of Russia proved themselves really well, and we can really be proud of them. And we will do everything so that the younger generation of Russia had as many opportunities as possible. Of course, this path starts in school. It was, and I'm convinced it will stay, it will remain a second home for them, which must be comfortable and modern. And as part of the current federal program, until the end of the 2024, we are going to build about 1,300 new schools that will be able to have uh, about 1 million students, and we are going to buy no less than 16,000 school buses. All the school buses must be state-of-the-art and they must be safe. Next, starting from last year, the class teachers, they have additional payments to their salaries, additional bonuses, and I think it's a fair decision. I remember how last time, last year, we talked about this, but still I get uh, letters from the teachers 
uh, who work in the vocational schools that we f forgot about them. That's true, and we must resolve this issue, and we must set the same additional payment of 5,000 rubles for the curators of uh, student groups who work in the vocational schools and colleges. I suggest in the next two years to allocate additionally 10 billion rubles for the repair and refurbishment of our teaching colleges. Uh, I urge the government to pay special attention for the training of future teachers because the future of the country depends on them. We also need to have uh, specialists in schools that are going to help the class leaders who are going to become mentors for the children who will make the education as interesting as possible for the kids. It's very important so that the younger people had role models, uh, victories of our ancestors and of course of our contemporary uh, fellow citizens. These younger kids, they should have the opportunity to get acquainted with the history of our country, with our multinational culture, with our achievements in science and literature in art, because still I'm looking through some textbooks and I'm amazed to see what's written there. It's like it's not about us even. Who's writing this? Who is allowing this to get published? It's really mind-blowing. So they write a lot of thing about the Second Front, but it doesn't even say sometimes about the Battle of Stalingrad. Who is the author of such a book. I don't even want to comment on this. So in the next two, three years, I suggest to allocate 24 billion rubles to renew the culture uh, palaces of museums and villages and in smaller towns of Russia. It's a very important area as well. And we need to relaunch uh, digitally the, the knowledge society work and we are remember it well and uh, it seems to exist but it seems like no one noticing it and to support the projects in culture in art and history we're going to create to establish the presidential initiatives fund and uh, we are going to finance already in this year more than 1.5 thousand of creative teams using the these funds in a month, the 11th graders are going to pass seat exams and about 60% of the graduates will be able to get paid uh, seats in colleges. And there is no other place I can uh, speak confidently about this. There is no such access to the free of charge higher education in no other country in the world as, in, as we have in Russia. In the next two years, additionally, we are going to introduce 45,000 paid uh, openings more in colleges and no less than 70% of those we are going to allocate to the regions of the Russian Federation where graduates need somewhere to continue their education. Starting from this year, no fewer than 100 colleges in the regions are going to get payments from 100 million rubles and more to start their technology parks to update uh, their labs and so on and so forth. And all the state colleges uh, will be able to get this support, including those that train future teachers, doctors, the transport and culture uh, employees. I am confident that the younger generation of uh, Russians, younger generations of Russian scientists, Russian researchers, will let their names be heard in the significant research projects. This year is the year of uh, science and technology. We know that in the modern world, uh, the science plays a vital role. And up until 2024, we are in Russia. Uh, from the federal budget, we are going to allocate 1 trillion 630 billion rubles. But that's not all of it. We are going to launch, that's not all of it, we are going to launch innovative program to update the critical areas for the development of the country. They will be considered uh, the project of state importance, of state significance. 
And firstly, we need to have uh, shield in sanitary and healthcare safety. We understand now what that is. We need to make Russia independent in manufacturing all range of vaccines, all the medical substances, including the medicines against infections, infections resilient to the current generation of antibiotics. And we need to make this using Russian uh, equipment and Russian components. And if there is an infection as dangerous as coronavirus, or maybe even more dangerous, Russia must be ready within four days and I am emphasizing within four days, we should be able to develop our own test kits and then to create effective domestic vaccine and to uh, roll it out massively. And these are the goals that we have for ourselves to achieve these goals. We want to achieve them by 2030, but the sooner we do it, the better. Second, we need to come up with a new comprehensive approach to our energy sector development. We need to come up with new nuclear energy technologies, hydropower energy, and then storing energy is another track where we need to make progress. We need to rise to the challenge of the climate change. We need to adapt our agriculture, our industries, our utilities. All the infrastructure we have should be aimed at reducing the impact on our environment. We need to bring down the emissions here we need to have more control and better monitoring. Over the last 30 years, the amount of greenhouse gases amassed in Russia should be reduced to that achieved by the EU in the next 30 years. Due to our geography and the structure of our economy, I believe we can do that. I'm absolutely sure that this goal, however difficult it is, can be achieved thanks to our technologies and our science our new energy, new healthcare, new pharmaceutical industries and climate change should be the stimuli to help us supercharge the effort in other areas, to modernize the economy and the public sector. This way we can achieve new jobs, high paying jobs for everyone. Efforts of the authorities, businesses, development institutions, Academy of Science should be all focused on increasing the living standards. And here we have a very special approach. We preserve our environment, our nature. It's a principle important. And we cannot and we will not backtrack on what we have set as our goals. The recent events in Norilsk, in S Sibirsk, well, they showed what may happen. We should prevent anything like that from happening again. I call upon the authorities of the Russian Federation to accelerate the adoption of a new law so that the owners of industrial companies would be bearing the responsibility for the emissions and the pollution that they emiss. It's a very simple approach. And yet, if you get the income at the cost of the environment, well, clear what you've done. Compensate for the damage you've dealt to our nature. So our authorities and our watchdogs should act responsibly. Companies should be also be transferring towards a closed circle economy, a circular economy. That is why next year we'll be introducing more responsibility for importers and producers so that they will be paying for recycling the packaging. I believe that experts, financial specialists, they don't really like to say that some kind of money should be given somewhere. And I believe that we need to allocate more money in order to reduce the damage that have accumulated over time. In 12 key industrial centers of Russia, the accumulated pollution should be reduced by 20% by the year 2024. I've said it already. It's a tall order, but we must achieve that thanks to comprehensive upgrades made in transportation, in utility sectors. Also, in addition to that, I think we should introduce quotas on damaging 
emissions in every city where there is a problem with the air quality. And those who violate, they should pay a price. Those who do not should act responsibly to keep within the limits. That should be done based on a transparent system of monitoring of emissions. We will support business initiatives to upgrade production facilities. We have state guarantees. We will be giving these guarantees to the metal production facilities in a number of cities and regions across Russia, such as Krasnoyarsk and Novokuznetsk. There will be other cities and other towns joining in. We will not limit ourselves to these regions I've just named. No, it's just an example. We're ready to do more. Last year, we allocated an unprecedented amount of money to support our economy through subsidized loans to companies so that they could still pay salaries to people. We saved five million jobs. This initiative, it worked. It worked thanks to businesses who have been very initiative. They were working hard to preserve the people. Unfortunately, some still were fired. Some lost their job. I know it's been hard for you, those who were unemployed or are unemployed. Our goal now is to bring the labor market back. And we need to do that fast so that people will come back to receiving the salaries they deserve. We need to be generating more jobs and we'll be helping private investments in order to make that happen. Last year, we doubled from, we reduced by two times the social insurance payments of companies from 30 to 15 percent. This is not going anywhere. This is, will be like that forever now, 15 percent. In one month, the government must come up with additional suggestions as to support medium and small companies, stimulating taxation, giving preferential loans and helping to deliver their products to the market, including through state purchases. As for other decisions and suggestions, well, here's what I have to say. First, we have written up a lot of archaic norms and regulations in many areas, including construction. There is no more unnecessary verifications and checks. We need to build momentum. We should not rest on our laurels. We should improve the investment environment and atmosphere. And these new benefits, they should be tangible to set up, based on the turnkey solution, a new industrial facility in Russia should be easier and faster than in other countries of the world, including developed countries. Non-commodity export companies should get more benefits than today. Yes, we've been helping them over the last years, but we need to do more so that these exporters will have no unnecessary restrictions in terms of foreign currency control. This is a problem today. But I believe that starting from July, this will change once and for all. We've discussed it a lot of times. We need to adopt amendments as soon as possible in the next half, one and a half months. Our talents, our entrepreneurs, they are very creative. They have the drive to change their life around to the better. They want to create jobs. And we need to support that drive. And we will do that. In the world of today, when the market situation is changing on a daily basis, it is important to help businesses because they face a lot of risk, especially if they invest in long-term projects. That is why we will be gearing the whole private investment support system up for something new. We'll be assessing the quality of these investments in terms of the technologies and products created to the benefit of the people. We'll be benchmarking it against the welfare of people and how it improves. We have a new mechanism now for special investment contracts. We have a new instrument. It's capital protection program. We have consolidated our developing institutions based on the, our investment fund. We work hard to reduce the risks of private investors. We should help them to get to new markets and invest more in their products and services. It's all part of the so-called fabrics for project-based financing and investment. The overall amount of investments is 3 trillion rubles. It's a high goal. I, 
believe we can do that. And I'm waiting to receive more from the government in terms of the ideas which were voiced back in March. Colleagues, you know that you should do that. All key solutions in the field of economy, we adopt them together with the business community. That's the kind of practice which has been around for years. And I believe that additional financial stimuli given to the businesses will yield good results. Namely, it will help us to transform the incomes. This will be investments into our growth and prosperity. Here is something important. It's not new because businesses know about that already. Incomes, profits of the corporate sector will be record high this year, even though we've had pandemic on our hands. Still, we believe that this is indeed going to happen. We'll wait and see how you will be using these benefits, these new money. Maybe we will need to upgrade our tax system. And I'm waiting for new solutions to be laid down on the table by the government. Now, off the record, if I may, I would like to say the following. Dividends. Some dividends go into people's hands. Some invest these dividends into their companies. And we will support those who invest what they get in order to achieve something more. Last year, we increased budget allocations. At the same time, we kept our financial situation in check. Together with the central bank, the government should continue working hard to have a responsible monetary policy to ensure macroeconomic stability, to keep inflation at bay within the limits we've set out for it. It's a priority, one of many, and I expect you to deliver. At the same time, today, thanks to our reserves and our budget capabilities, we can increase the money that we allocate for investments in infrastructure. And we can give the regions of Russia new instruments for growth and prosperity. To make that happen, we will need to make some amendments to the legislation. I expect that the parties of Russia, the Just Russia, Spartanibar Russia, the LDPR, the Communist Party and the United Russia will support this initiative. I'd like to thank everyone, everyone working hand in hand for their patriotism, for their meaningful contribution throughout the pandemic. Thanks to you, we have achieved a lot. It's not just a formality. I'm deeply grateful for you. Efforts, you helped us to keep our country stable. It was especially important when we were preparing and we are preparing for the stadium election, the lower chamber of the parliament of the Russian Federation. We have a lot of work on our hands and I believe that the drive on your part, that willingness to compete, but do that fairly, will remain because we all share the same goals and the same objectives. Colleagues, our country is progressing, but it can progress only when regions, each and every region is progressing, is making strides. And I call upon you, the governors, the leaders of Russia to make your regions thrive. And we will support you in that endeavor. Those who take more responsibility and start new projects will get support. I'm sure that there is a lot of potential to unlock in every region. We want to contribute meaningfully. And for that, I believe we need to do one thing. And you know what? The governors know what I'm talking about. The debt burden. It lays heavy on your shoulders. And we need to help you to carry that weight. By June, by the 1st of June, I will be Looking forward to receiving your proposals as to how we can uh, help regional and municipal budgets. How can we increase the independency and capabilities of every region? We'll be discussing that at the next meeting of the State Council, taking account the priority decisions which we have approved. First and foremost, we need to support the regions which have a lot of commercial debt on their hands. And I think we can do it through the following. All the commercial debt accumulated by a region which exceeds 25% of its own income revenues should be 
paid for by state loans, which are to be cleared by the year 2029. On top of that, I believe we can restructure the budget loans which have been granted to regions last year to effectively respond to the pandemic. I think that's a fair thing to do. Let me remind you that these loans are to be paid off in two months, July the 1st. I believe we can extend the deadline they will be doing that all the year to the, all the way to the year 2029 they'll have a lot more time restructuring these debts is a way is a mechanism to increase the capabilities of these regions so that they would be able to work on their own will be giving the regions of russia a new instrument to achieve greater levels of prosperity these are infrastructure state loans and the interest rate will be not more than three percent the deadline 15 years by the end of the 2023 we'll be granting five billion 500 billion rubles worth of such loans We'll be restructuring the debts, and we need to do that on a fair basis, on a fair and just basis. One regions have more debt, others have less credit money, because they were not getting one loan after another. Maybe they will feel that they are at a loss, but they are not. We are f going to work based on a very fair and just principle. We'll be helping you because we have agreed a number of principles. The less debt you had, the more loans you will get for future prosperity. We are one country. We are one country. All levels of authority and businesses should work hand in hand pursuing the same goals. We need to restructure the debts. We should give out more investments in the form of state loans. That will open up new possibilities for us. We'll be able to engage in long-term projects. We will be working to make our national goals happen. We'll be upgrading all the infrastructure in Russia, which binds together the regions of our country. State loans is a powerful instrument how meaningful that will be, how much investments it will help us to attract, well, that depends on the regions, on the local teams, and how they will be working with investors and businesses, and of course, with people, with citizens. These infrastructure projects should be aimed at fulfilling the needs and wants of people. These investments should create new jobs, increase the living standards of millions of our families, these investments should mean a better future for our children. We'll be revamping our road infrastructure, city infrastructure, utilities infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, everything. Holistic approach is needed to improve the tourism industry. Infrastructure investments and state loans will be supervised by the Treasury of Russia. This money will be given only to those projects which have been assessed from every angle and deemed worthy of such loan. Again, I'm saying this to you, authorities of all levels, let's work in sync as one. I don't want to say any harsh words, but let me tell you this. We should do things in time. We shouldn't be just running around with nice pictures of what we can do. No. Empty words, empty talk is not enough. Let's help each other out. Let's discard good projects. Let's just help to improve them. Some don't know how to do that. Help them to do it right. And then it will 
fly. It will be a success. These projects and their scope and scale can differ. The idea is that they will mean a lot to people. The Yamala Nenetsky region is one example. Together with our major companies, it can work based on that mechanism to come to create northern railroad system, which would be a huge impetus to the exploration of new resources in the Arctic region. This project has been around for many years. It's time to supercharge this effort. Nizhny Novgorod will be able to continue its metro construction project. It will be able to improve the city center attractivity attractiveness to people. The city of Chelyabinsk will be able to revamp its transportation sector and build metro. There is a number of projects in Krasnoyarsk and other cities. It can be coupled and it should be coupled with some new technologies introduced in the construction process. The government should come up with a holistic approach to using digital planning and design. The cutting edge technologies and energy saving technologies should be part of your work. It is also important to respond to the climate changes, ecological challenges, and the infrastructural development sets new uh, goals for the construction industry. In the past difficult year, it worked without any mishaps. More than 80 million square meters of housing was delivered. It's a good result, and the more we build, the more accessible the housing is for Russian families. That's why it, it's an ambitious goal, and we have already talked about it, and it hasn't gone anywhere, this ambitious goal, annually to have about 120 million square meters to be delivered. And we must have a special mechanism to support the individual uh, housing construction. As for the massive development, the Dom RF institution is going to attract resources from the financial market via bonds. This mechanism is a proven mechanism and uh, has been working quite well, and these resources must be given to the developers as loans. What's important here, what I would like to emphasize here, using the subsidies from the federal budget, DOM.RF will give out loans to the developers using a minimal interest, about three, four, uh, percent. And the pilot test projects are going to be the development of the housing in Tula, Tmen, Sahalin region, and Kuzbas, and uh, beautification of the villages and towns. And the housing development are the vital areas for the regions, and we shouldn't forget about the everyday problems of our citizens. A lot of Russian families now live in the settlements that already have uh, gas pipes delivered to these towns, but their houses still have no access to gas main lines for whatever reason. It seems here is the gas pipe, but they still don't have gas at their household. So I instruct the government with the regions to develop the plan to bring deliver gas to such households and I'm talking about bringing gas pipe to the a lot, and it should be done free of charge for the people living on said land lot. And as I have already said, the government should work through all the details with Gazprom and with other companies, with other institutions involved in this year so not to have any problems here because I'm talking about this issue there and then something wrong goes with some commas or with some phrasing and everything halts. No, we can't have a problem like this. All the organizations like Mosobel Gas, they need to understand what should be done, when it should be done, and what are the codes. Of course, the goal is bigger here. We should suggest uh, the solutions for every individual region so that the citizens had access for the clean renewable energy. It could be electric power from the renewable sources. It could be uh, sustainable use of coal, which is also possible in the modern world. Uh, it could be a liquefied gas, and I instruct the leaders of the regions uh, 
to work with the government to come up with such plans and to start to implement them in the next year. Thus, for example, for Kamchatka, we need to plan a local infrastructure for keeping gas so that we could provide a long-term access to gas for the citizens and enterprises uh, from Kamchatka. Dear colleagues, we are not only going to give a new instrument for development, development to the regions, but we will allocate funds to help them to resolve the most urgent problems that have a complex effect to improve, to develop the quality of uh, life for their citizens. And the National Welfare Fund will allocate money to develop the backbone infrastructure, and we need to expedite uh, the construction of the highway between Moscow and Kazan and to extend it further to Yekaterinburg. And this project must be completed in three years. Thus, in 2024, keeping in mind uh, that there is already a highway between Moscow and St. Petersburg and the Central Circle Road, we are going to have safe, high-speed traffic starting from the Baltic Sea up until the Urals. But it's not enough just to connect these uh, dots between each other. Because what will change for people in small towns and smaller cities, the cars will be just uh, passing by. Uh, trains are going to fly by. The backbone infrastructure must help to develop all the regions that it's crossing to create the modern infrastructure. And using these new loans, the regions will be able to increase the tempo, the pace of such construction efforts. And colleagues should keep it in mind in their planning so that the federal and regional highways uh, work as a system, as a unified network in the interest of our citizens, of our businesses. Infrastructural loans and the resources of the national funds are going to work all across Russia, in all the regions of Russia. And the same as will our new national project in tourism. In the near future, we are going to launch uh, the subsidized loans to develop and update uh, the hotels and other tourist infrastructure. And the interest rate for these loans will have a horizon of 15 years, and it also will consist of 3 to 5 percent. And the test projects in this area, we are going to have a lot of test projects. I will name a few. It's the development of Sheregesh of the Kuzbaski Resort, Yacht uh, Resort, and uh, Balaklav Buchta in Sevastopol, improvement of the Altai infrastructure in, in Kaliningrad. And the using the infrastructural loans, uh, the new impetus will be given to the entire tourist clusters, like regions in the central of Russia, will uh, reach a new quality level to develop the Golden Ring uh, tourist routes to develop the tourist potential of such towns as Tarusa, Palich, Murom, Garahavets, Tutaev, Borovsk, uh, towns in Volga Basin on Crimea will also get a chance to develop even further such resorts as Stara Rusa in Novgorod region, uh, mineral waters in Caucasus, and towns like Kislovodsk. So Russia is a hospitable land. Russia is a hospitable land open for true friends. You remember what happened during the World Cup. As soon as the epidemiological situation allows, we will lift the restrictions and we will get millions of tourists from all over the world. And we have a goal so, so that from most of the countries, if it's possible, to get an e-visa in just four days to visit Russia, to come to Russia without too much effort. So, dear colleagues, the idea in, of the Russia's foreign policy, I will uh, speak a few words about this as well as a conclusion. We should provide peace and safety for 
our citizens for the development of our country. Russia has its own interests. Of course we do. The interests we defend and we are going to uphold within the international law, under international law, as it's done by other nations in the world. And if someone refuses to understand this obvious thing and they don't want to engage in a dialogue and they opt for looking down upon us, Russia will have a way to defend our position. At the same time, unfortunately, regrettably, everyone is getting used to the practice of the politically motivated unlawful sanctions in economy to the to the attempts to impose their will to the others. But such practice is reborn now, is changing into something much more dangerous. What I mean is the fact that has become known of the attempt to organize a coup in Belarus and the assassination of the president of the country. And even such blatant actions, they are not condemned by the so-called Western nations. It seems like no one even notices this. Everyone pretends that nothing is going on. But listen, you can say whatever you want about the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, or about Maduro in Venezuela. But once again, you can have whatever opinion you want about Yanukovych, who was always killed and who was overthrown by a, a armed coup. You can have whatever opinion you want about the political views of the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, but organizing, plotting a coup, planning a political assassination of the leaders of the country, well, it's too much. And just listen to the admissions made by the participants of the coup that uh, Minsk was supposed to be sieged, including the city infrastructure, shutting off the entire power infrastructure of the capital of Belarus. It means that, actually, it means that they were preparing to the massive cyber offensive action. How else you can call that? So you can't do it without with switching just one lever. And it's not for nothing our Western counterparts are refusing or denying to hear to the Russian suggestions to have a dialogue in the cybersecurity. We have suggested it a number of times, but they avoid even discussing the matter. And what would happen if the attempt of the state coup that uh, really happened in Belarus because everything was going this way. How many people would have suffered then? What would have been destiny of Belarus? No one is thinking about that. Like no one was thinking about the fate of Ukraine when coup d'etat happened in that country. And unfriendly activities towards Russia are not stopping either. Some countries has made it a habit with every reason and most often without any reason to talk about Russia. It's like a, a sporting competition for them, a new kind of sport for them, who is going to be the loudest uh, speaking against Russia. And we are trying to be reserved in this regard. I'm not even trying to be sarcastic. We are really modest in this regard. Usually we don't even respond to these unfriendly efforts, but we don't even respond to the rudeness, blatant rudeness. We want to keep good neighborly relations with all the participants of the international efforts. But we see what's happening in the real world. They are picking on Russia here and there without any reason. And it's like, around a large tiger, you can see all those smaller hyenas. It's like from the Rudyard Kipling's novels. They are just being yes men to their, uh, to their leader. Kipling was truly a great writer. We want to keep good relations with all the participants of the foreign policies, including those that we are not really having good relations with in the recent past. We don't want to burn breaches, but 
if someone sees our good intentions as indifference or weakness and they want to burn the bridges or blow up the bridges from their side, they should remember this. Russia's answer will be asymmetrical. It will be quick and it will be tough. Everyone who is coming up with the provocations that are a threat to our interests will regret about things they do the way they didn't regret about a lot of things in a while. And I have to say this. We have enough patience. We have enough responsibility. We have enough professional qualities, we have enough confidence in our righteousness, and we have enough common sense when we making any decisions. But I hope no one would think about crossing the line in, uh, in the relations with Russia. And we will define where this line is by ourselves in every individual case. And uh, I can help but mention today, as it's usual the case in my annual addresses to the Federal Assembly, about uh, strengthening of the Russian armed forces is a continuing ongoing process. And we will pay special attention to the development of military education. It will be made both in military institutions and also in the military educational centers with in the civil colleges. By 2024, the share of the modern uh, military equipment will be almost 76%, uh, which is a good notion. And in the nuclear armed forces, it will be more than 88%. We already have on duty, on battle duty, the state-of-the-art hypersound missile complexes of intercontinental uh, code Avangard, laser battle complexes, Peresvet, and the first regiment uh, fully equipped, fully armed with uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, Sarmat, will be delivered according to the plan by the end of 2022. We are going to increase, we are increasing the number of the uh, attacking aircraft with the uh, Kinjal missiles, ships armed with the uh, hypersound weapons, Kinjal and Caliber missiles. We are going to deliver in the near future hypersound missiles, Circon. And in full correspondence to our previous prior plans, we are working on the other state-of-the-art uh, battle complexes, including Poseidon, Berevesnik, and other systems. And being a leader in uh, building the state-of-the-art weapon systems and developing the modern nuclear forces, Russia is suggesting to our counterparts to discuss the matters concerning the strategic weapons, uh, matters regarding strategical safety and stability, uh, coexistence, in the safety that would uh, grasp not only traditional weapons, intercontinental ballistic missiles and heavy bombers and submarines, but all the offensive and defensive systems that are able to solve strategic goals no matter what their actual equipment are. The five nuclear powers have special responsibility in this regard. Hopefully, the initiative to, uh, to meet within the five leaders of the Permanent Security Council members will be implemented as soon as we can, as soon as we will uh, resolve the epidemiological situation. Russia is open for the wide cooperation. We have consistently supported the strengthening of the key role in international issues, uh, the key role of the United Nations organizations. We strive to support uh, the UN role in the settlement, resolving the local conflicts to stabilize the situation in Syria, to start the national international dialogue in Libya. Russia has played a major role in uh, stopping 
uh, the armed conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And based on this mutual respect, we're trying to build our ties with the vast majority of the countries in the world, in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, with a lot of countries in Europe as well. And we have uh, consistently developed the context with our uh, partners and SCO and BRICS in the CIS with our allies in CSTO. We have a lot of projects that unite us within the Eurasian Economic Union. We aim to improve our economies, improve the living of our people. We have a lot of new areas to explore, such as transportation, logistics, and corridors that would unite our countries, bind us together. This is going to be the backbone of the large Eurasian cooperation framework. This framework is already here. We are aligning and harmonizing our work with the work of other countries. Integration is a priority. It's just not theory. This is practice. We've already done a lot to ensure that we can achieve our national goals. I started with the healthcare today. And I would like to draw the bottom line and say that no one in the whole world knew what kind of problem we would run into. But we, Russia, Russians, have done a lot and we will do even more to prevent any further threats. We have everything in place to make that true. We have a lot of potential to unlock the healthcare, the science, the education, the industries. Yet we need to do more. We should not rest on our laurels. We have outlined the national development goals. Now we need to achieve them. Of course, the pandemic has introduced some adjustments to our plans. Today I talked about the, the demographic situation. I discussed the support which we need to give to families to create jobs and how we can improve the entrepreneurship framework and improve governance in Russia. These are our priorities now. And when you come up with new ideas how to improve the social and economic situation in Russia, please take into account these priorities. I will be expected to receive such proposals and suggestions by July the 1st this year. Please do not forget about our strategic development, our strategic goals, national goals. Let's work hard to achieve them as soon as we can. Together with the experts and business communities, the civic chamber, we can take stock of what we've done. We should hold a wide ranging discussion on all the organizational and financial issues and that will be part of the agenda for the next state council meeting. Now, once again, I would like to address the citizens of Russia. I promise that we will do everything within our power to deliver on what we've promised. I'm sure that we will be going strong together as one. And as one, united, we will achieve all the goals. We'll meet all the objectives. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and goodbye.